Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you this evening. Before I get into that, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email, wes at sasquatchronicles.com. And if you get a chance when you shoot me your email, please include your contact information, a way for me to call you. Again, it's wes at sasquatchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, please visit the website, sasquatchronicles.com. Uh, become a subscriber, get additional shows. I, I really appreciate you guys being here tonight. I really appreciate you guys listening. A fan favorite has returned, Duke. A lot of you remember him from last Sunday's show. I got a lot of emails asking me to have Duke return to the show to talk about mountain giants. So if you're curious about mountain giants, this is the show for you. I want to jump into it tonight. There's a lot to get to. Duke, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here tonight. Hey, it's always a pleasure. Glad to be back and uh, really overwhelmed by the response from the fans out there. Really glad you guys enjoyed the last show. and Hopefully we can give you some more interesting stuff to listen to on this one. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit more, I know on the last show you and I talked about the, uh, I brought it up real briefly about that Nephilim in Afghanistan that was killed by the soldiers and you started going into the mountain giants. You know, we just moved along with the conversation and a lot of people stopped and went, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What what was that you guys were just talking about? (laughs) So what I thought we'd do is bring you back on here and, and, you know, give us a presentation on on the mountain giants. Tell us a little bit about the mountain giants. Tell us where, how did it start? Why did you start looking into it? And what did you find? Well, let's go back to the uh, the very very beginning of the mountain giant thing, uh, as it sort of exists at this point, which is pretty loose and not many people paying attention to it. But as I uh, mentioned during the last interview, it started out with uh, Bigfoot superhero Canadian John Green. Um, actually being the first person to notice this. And I'd like to actually quote uh, Lauren Coleman from the Forward to True Giants on this one. And he says, by the late 1960s, some researchers began to realize that something bigger than Bigfoot was out there, being seen and leaving enormous tracks nearly two feet long. One of these researchers, John Green, had noticed from the accounts he had collected in North America that a whole group of giants existed, who were clearly bigger than the Sasquatch of the Pacific Northwest. Green was convinced that the evidence supported their existence because he had talked to the witnesses who were very certain as to what they had seen. So he was the first one that noticed this. He was collecting these reports like we talked about last time, where you had all of these different things in the reports that were so unlike a Bigfoot report, but yet consistent with each other that it made him start thinking that there was a pattern to it and that there was, in fact, something out there other than Bigfoot. Well, this was enough information to get Lauren Coleman and Mark Hall going on it and go through the... And each one of those guys has been doing this for umpteen years, so they must have collected a lot of reports and went through all the reports that they had and went, well, which ones fit this pattern? And lo and behold, they actually had quite a few of them. They had enough to actually put out a, a small book on it. And like I mentioned last time, True Giants is Gigantic Bithic is Still Alive by Mark Hall and Martin Coleman. There's very little information on what they call True Giants and what I call a mountain giant. And the reason I call it mountain giants is because I've done more research on some of the really, really old sightings. And um, as you probably are aware, Wes, in addition to calling them Wild Man and Yahoo and some of the other colloquial names for them, the name Mountain Giant pops up every so often. And it seems like it's usually used in conjunction with something which pretty much fits the bill of description on these things, which is to say a lot larger than a regular Bigfoot. Uh, feet, uh, tracks that have been found vary from 7 inches to 36 inches. 36 inches way outside the regular size for a Bigfoot's track. Uh, four-toed prints. The creatures themselves, when they're sighted, uh, don't fit the usual description of a Bigfoot. They're not massive and thick. They don't look like the Incredible Hulk with a fur coat on. Um, They're built more like uh, Shaquille O'Neal or something like that. There's, you know, some other details that go along with these things that make them very unlike the regular Bigfoot reports. Um, As I mentioned last time, too, there's also a bunch of the native tribes that have multiple names for Bigfoot. And I I actually found one that had eight names for Bigfoot. And three of these you could attribute to some uh, local story about a particular individual, and they had a particular name for it. But uh, as 
in that case and in a bunch of others, there were multiple names for Bigfoot. And you could pretty much tell by looking at the description how the name translated that there was one of them that they were talking about what we would think of as a regular Bigfoot or Sasquatch. And the other name was for something way worse and scarier, um, judging by the description, that they were talking about definitely something different. And then when any of these things actually had stories attached to them, the attributes that came with it, were universally negative and uh, unpleasant. Uh, they were not only gigantic, but uh, they were also uh, very aggressive. They would attack people without, with little or no provocation. If they think they could stomp you and get away with it, they definitely would do it. Um, known to be man-eaters. All the tribes had legends you know, that, that had any name for them. The legends all were about how these things were attacking the tribe and eating all kinds of people. And, you know, usually there was some big conflict and they drove it away somehow or something, you know, along those lines. And that's what most of these stories seem to revolve around. So, again, it was, you know, a really negative connotation that went along with these things. And the only thing that I can say is that, thank God, they're very rare because uh, you just rarely run into reports of, Wes, how often do you think we get a decent set of tracks having pictures taken of them or uh, a pretty reasonable, believable Bigfoot sighting happened, like maybe once or twice a week? Yeah, I would say so. Now, these things you find maybe uh, every two or three years, somebody will find a track line, if that often. And it may be 10 years in between sightings. So that tells me two things. First of all, there's a lot less of them. And secondly, they're probably not in areas around where humans populate. They take too big of an amount of land to move around on to have enough food available for them. they got to be out in the middle of nowhere. Plus, if they were anywhere near humans, there'd be conflicts. People would be disappearing on a regular basis. It would become quite noticeable. And, you know, suspicion would be cast in the direction of something unusual going on. So um, I think that they are, they are still around. They're very rare. They live in predominantly mountainous or extremely uh, heavily wooded areas. I've got it on uh, some pretty good, uh, believable uh, witness accounts that they're still up in Alaska. Um, like last time, I even mentioned one of the places where they could be found. If you're so crazy as to want to go there, and I definitely think that you should not do this. But uh, <sighs> considering some of the other attributes that go along with them, I really, really think you should do this. But uh, I know that you you mentioned earlier when we were talking that you actually had collected some accounts that you sort of shelved and went, I just don't know what to make of this. And then you started noticing there was a pattern between the accounts you had gotten, too. Yeah, I have gotten a few accounts, and I was, really wasn't sure what, what to make of them. Uh, before I go into that, I know, uh, Duke, you had sent me some footprints. And would it be all right if I post those on Sasquatch Chronicles under this episode for people to look at? I was blown away when I saw those footprints. I was like, what the heck is this? Uh, yeah, that was sort of the reaction I had when I saw them, too. And, yeah, go ahead and post them up. That's what I sent them to you for, so everybody else could take a look at them and see that, you know, this isn't just some imaginary thing. There really are tracks to go along with this thing. People have been finding them, and uh, usually they're gigantic. Also, some of the the uh, sightings in the past of really aggressive Bigfoot encounters that have become almost like semi-legendary may have been attributed to Bigfoot incorrectly. They possibly should have actually been going into the category of mountain giants because their aggressive behavior and excessively gigantic size seems to point away from, uh, from the usual Sasquatch Bigfoot type sightings. I would tend to agree with that. Uh, you know, I've gotten some, going back to some of the reports I've gotten, I think as long as I've been doing this, I think I've gotten maybe three total. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one I, I can really think of was in Alaska, believe it or not, and the the guy was hunting. And he said, Wes, I've been listening to your show for a long time. He didn't want to come on the air. Uh, he said, I, th I think what I saw was something else. And I go, well, what did you see? And he goes, we were up way up in the mountains we were hunting in the middle of nowhere and he goes uh, he goes i don't know what to tell you he goes it was a very very large man-like creature but the size was just enormous and i said well how big was it and he goes maybe 18 19 feet uh he goes me he goes it, it wasn't like 10 feet tall he goes the thing was just enormous and it was heading up the side of the mountain and he said it had tusks. And I go, what do you mean it had tusks? And he goes, well, it had like um, 
lower canines and it had tusks. He goes, I don't know what to tell you. It had tusks. He goes, I'm not crazy. I've never seen a Sasquatch. He goes, I don't think this thing was a Sasquatch, but it was huge. He goes, it's way out of the, the perimeter of, you know, eight, nine, ten feet tall. He goes, this thing was a, a monster. And he goes, I, be, I was terrified when I saw it and I saw it from a distance and I went the opposite direction. He goes, I, I, he goes, I can't tell you where it went. I can't tell you. He goes, but it was huge. And what was interesting about that particular encounter is that the guy wasn't trying to sell me on anything. He didn't want to come on the show. He just wanted to relay this to me. And one of the things he said, he goes, I don't, I don't think it was a Sasquatch. He goes, it, it was just too big. He goes, I don't know what it was. I d- was not hallucinating. He's like, I wasn't drinking. I didn't smoke anything. I don't do drugs. <laughs> he goes, but I'm telling you, this thing was a freaking giant. He goes, I, I don't know what else to tell you. And and so I've gotten, uh, and it's very few, like I said, maybe two or three reports I've gotten of these things. And generally speaking, those people don't want to come on the air uh, because he said it's so, he goes, I don't think anyone would believe me. And I, I, I kind of believe this guy. I mean, I after doing this for a while, you get a sense when someone's full of it and when they're, you know, you give me five minutes with someone and I, and I can kind of tell you if, if they have some mental issues or they're actually have seen something. Right. And I've been, I've been lucky because I think 99% of the people I've talked to, have they've seen something. Uh, and this guy saw something. He was terrified. He, he gave up hunting and it just kind of blew me away. I really wasn't sure where to place that, but you're right. When you look at some of the old native, especially the native American stories, you almost kind of get a sense they're talking about two separate things. They're talking about Sasquatch here, but they're talking about something else over here. And I think as you read old reports, we kind of lump everything into Sasquatch. When mm-hmm. you, you kind of feel like deep down, they're really not talking about Sasquatch. They're talking about something else. Yeah, uh, you know, and I totally agree with that because, like, you know, we were talking about last time. The, the typical Bigfoot Sasquatch characterization is just of a shy, retiring creature that wants to stay away from you, wants to be left alone. He's not looking for trouble. He's not trying to hurt someone. As long as you're not in his territory, making a big mess and causing problems for him, he's just going to try and stay away from you. And these things have exactly the opposite sort of behavior. They're not at all afraid of people. They'll come out looking for trouble. They don't really care if you see them or not. They'll just stamp on you. You know, because let's face it, if something is 19 feet tall, built like that, we're talking six, 7,000 pounds, they decide to stamp on you, you're done. One stamp, squish, that's it, you're done. Yeah, I agree, and the other thing I will say that's consistent between the reports I've gotten, uh, off the two or three reports I've gotten, I think each person said it had tusk, which threw me off, uh, mm-hmm. because one of them said that it had huge teeth coming out like uh I said, like, elephant tusks? And he said, no, I think it was its teeth. He goes, I think it was bottom canine teeth that were sticking out. And he goes, it kind of looked like tusks. And every witness I've talked to, that that's one thing they've brought up beyond just the enormous size. That's something consistent out of the very few reports I've taken. Right, and the ones I've come across where there's actually any sort of mention or maybe they got, you know, the ones where they actually got to see the face they could tell. They, again, would talk about that. Well, you know, it had these big old tusks, and for, you know, quite a while I was trying to figure out what... Obviously, you're talking about the lower canines protruding somehow. What is it they're talking about? And just recently came across more information that makes me think that really what they're talking... They're trying to describe like a uh, a boar's tusk sort of thing, like a curved lower, you know, tusk coming out of the mouth. And and like I I said to you earlier here uh, before we got uh, on the air that... Um, how often have you seen depictions of fairy tale ogres and giants with exactly that attribute, those weird tusks coming out of their mouth? Now, where did they all get that weird idea from? Yeah, and you're right. You, as you look at old, you know, the old, I guess, quote unquote, fairy tales, these mm-hmm. the Jolly Green Giant. Well, I think America has the Jolly Green Giant. Really, wasn't a friendly giant. We we put them on a can of peas or whatever vegetable it is. And, <laughs> made him into this friendly giant. But if you read the, you know, the old stories, Jack be nimble, Jack be quick. Well, there's a reason why he needs to be nimble and he needs to be quick. It's because the giant's going to kill him. 
uh, <laughs> we've we've Americanized it, and made it into uh, canned vegetables. Mm-hmm. But you're right. You know, when you look at some of the old old depictions, especially like Greek mythology, they do have these tusks, and it didn't hit me until, like I said, those very few people I've talked to. What are these things? I mean, where do you? What's your take after researching this? Where do you think they come from? What are they? What are people seeing? Well, they're seeing a real creature of some kind. Where you know, where did it come from? Well, obviously they've been around long enough that the natives are well acquainted with them and have lots of old legends and even names for them. So they've been here for a long time. Are they actually like a sub variety of Bigfoot or something? I really don't think so at this point. I'm not sure that they're actually related. They might have been on a, a parallel line of development along with, you know, humans, great apes, Bigfoot, whatever. They could be some kind of a weird hybrid, too. I mean, you know, for those that like to think about the Nephilim or the ancient giants or something, well, what if one of them crossbred with a really big Bigfoot? And what kind of a kid would that produce? Might look something like that. But, you know, that's... At this point, that's just going to be utter speculation because we just have not even come close to gathering enough information on these things. And part of the, the reason is, is because they're really rare. And part of the reason is because they're incredibly dangerous. So, you know, uh, who wants to go? I, I'm looking for volunteers. Who wants to go to uh, take an expedition out to uh, one of the areas where they're known to live and get some pictures of them for me? <laughs> I'm not doing it. I'm not going there. Uh-uh. No. If I find their tracks, that's enough to let me know that they're in the area, and I probably shouldn't be researching there anyway. And uh, the, the tracks, the, the, the pictures that you're going to post you know, for everybody to take a look at were collected right here in Montana, about 30 miles from where I'm sitting right now, in a tiny little deserted ghost town called Coloma, which was a mining town. Before it was there, there was an Indian burial ground which is right next to the mining town. That might have been some bad karma right there, building a mining town right next to an Indian burial ground. Um, There's another really horrible rumor going around that what sank the town was that the mines had played out pretty much. They, They weren't getting enough actual mineral wealth out of them to make it worth the effort to keep doing it. And in those days, they were paying their workers every two weeks. And so... They waited until it was payday, basically, and rather than paying their workers, they collapsed the mine on them, which is why the mine has collapsed, and that has been uh, found by archaeologists that are actually doing some work up there now that, yes, in fact, the mines were collapsed. Um, I'm not sure if they found any uh, remains in there or anything, but the rumor is that they were uh, Chinese workers who had, you know, maybe previously been working on the uh, the railway system going through here, and figured they'd get a job working in the mines or something and you know so there's that whole thing going on and then you've got finding tracks of a mountain giant there now you start putting all that together and it makes this area really really unappealing to be in uh you know anybody that's superstitious at all pretty much doesn't want to be there uh we took a video of uh our little em meter going completely crazy there and i mean it was buried in the red it's constant for over three minutes and it took me about 15, 20 seconds just to pull the camera out and get focused on it and start videotaping it. We still got like 2 minutes, 45 seconds of this thing just buried. And finally, there was a person who was asking questions to the entity that was there and said, well, if you're here, can you turn off this little box over here? Off it went. So that was pretty creepy, you know. So during the day, we're talking to ghosts, and at night, we're we're looking for mountain giants. Uh, <laughs> And I got to tell you, you know, when we weren't getting enough action to keep us totally terrified, we actually got into the uh, SUV that uh, Researcher X had there with us, and we listened to an episode of Sasquatch Chronicles. So there you go. <laughs> well, I, you know, you talk about ghosts or mountain giants, and uh, my shows, you know, there I, I doubt it's terrifying when you start hearing that kind of stuff. I, you know, I I hate ghosts. I hate that whole subject. You know, I think there's something to it. I wanted to ask you, uh, Vince B. from Sasquatch Chronicles, he's a uh, subscriber. He said, I have a special request. On a recent show, you talked to someone who mentioned that an airman was hiking in Montana with his family and got chased out by a 15-foot-tall Bigfoot. That was, in fact, me, and I was recounting the story that I have pulled up in front of me right now. 
So I'm going to read it to you so that I don't get any, any details on it wrong. Year was 1977. This happened right here in Montana. Now, this is one of two reports that I've got of Mountain Giants in Montana, um, not including the tracks that we found. Year was 1977. It was August. Great time to go do some camping in Montana. There were three men, two youngsters in this group that were camping, and they went to a hill above Belt Creek Canyon. However, a wicked thunderstorm struck their little camp about 2 a.m. on August 20th, and they decided that uh, safety was a better option than valor and decided to head back to the vehicle. Now, on their way back, they heard some kind of a weird noise which attracted their attention. The man in question, Fred C. Wilson, was one of these three men who, and Fred was the one who took it past a polygraph test on this story. He tells us what happens next, and I quote, I turned on my flashlight and saw this huge creature standing beside a tree about 25 yards away. We watched it for about 10 seconds before it moved off into the trees, and then we ran for the car, unquote. Okay, by the time the men reached the car, the creature, still walking upright, is crossing a clearing. Now, keep in mind, this is at night during a thunderstorm. There's probably lightning crashing down, and they're intermittently it's lighting things up, and they can see this damn monster over there. This has got to be really unnerving. Well... By the time they reached the car, the creature still walking on was crossing a clearing, and at this point, they made a dreadful mistake. One of Fred's companions fired his shotgun twice to frighten the animal away from him. According to Mr. Wilson, and I quote, the shots were not fired at the animal, but only adjacent to it, unquote. And again, quoting, we were not trying to shoot it, we were just trying to keep it away from us so we could get out of there, unquote. But instead, the 15-foot-tall hairy monster charged their car. According to Wilson, and here's his description, it looked like a semi-truck coming at us. It took 40-foot strides. It was hideous. It had small, apish-type eyes, a flattened nose, and canine-type fangs, which showed when its mouth was open. Its face was totally covered with hair, and the head was oblong. Three men were all airmen from Monster Air Force Base, which is right here in Montana. And the other two men, who wished not to be named, backed up Fred's story 100%. They said the creature got to within 20 feet of the vehicle before they got up enough speed to outdistance it. Now, there's no question that the men's aggressive actions helped to trigger the charge, which may or may not have been a bluff charge. Um, but it, it's also important to add the side note that the character of these creatures as noted by the local natives does not lend a whole lot of uh, <clears throat> positivity to the whole thing. Um, in addition to the names for Bigfoot, which they all have, they have to see names for these creatures as well. The Coeur d'Alene, Kalispell, and Flathead Indian tribes call it Natlitzkiligutan, which means killers of men. While the northern Paiute call it the Musho, or crushers of people. Most recent reports, other than the Coloma tracks, of course, come to us from New Mexico, possibly, in August of 2005. Three 10 to 12 foot tall behemoths were sighted there, and the Navajo, who have no legends of Bigfoot, but do have legends of something else that they call Yeltso in their language, and this word translates to mean really monstrous. So there you have it. Sweet Jesus. That's the guy that, that I was talking about, and that was his actual description. Yeah, and that's terrifying. That, that uh, you know, and that's coming from an airman where, Ch- you know, he has everything to lose. Exactly. Uh, coming out. To- yeah, you know, it isn't like somebody that's going to go tell a tall tale just for a lark because they want to get some attention or something. This guy's risking his entire life and livelihood coming out and telling a crazy story like this. And then he does it under oath and has both of his buddies back it up, too. You know, so uh, it's hard to see what the end game for something like that was since it's basically an unknown story at this point. There's very few people that have even heard of it. Yeah, and it's interesting too. Uh, you know, we talked about that uh, giant in Afghanistan. We I talked about it on the last show, and what was that giant doing? Why did the military have to go in and step in? Because it was killing people. It was killing Marines mm-hmm. and eating and eating them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you start to see little correlations, definitely in some of these stories. Uh, Don Ray, uh, he's asking, wondering if. The Valley of the Headless Men has had any sightings of giants. And for people out there who don't know, the Valley of the Headless Men, I believe, is in Canada. And a lot of people go missing in that area. I know the local tribes will tell you not to go in that area. Um, but have you heard of any giants in that area? 
I have not heard any reports specifically of giants in that area, although it's interesting to note that the local tribe over the course of the last couple, two, three hundred years has been gradually moving their village further and further away from the rim. <laughs> so there's something there that they're really uncomfortable being anywhere near, and occasionally they decide they're still too close. They move their village a little bit further. Um, the legends about this thing are, are really creepy. There's apparently a uh, good reason to believe there's mineral wealth there. There's been a lot of prospectors that have gone into the, the canyon against the advice of the locals to go prospect, and one of them even set up a cabin and was there for a little while. All of them have been found without their heads. In a couple of cases, they actually sent in crews to find these guys. You know, they went missing, go find them. And they never came back. So there's something there that's killing people and taking their heads off. And, uh, you know, look for trophies. Is it some really primitive tribe that's still living in the area that's like trophy hunting for heads? Or is it one of the sub varieties we were talking about last week? Uh, you know, like a Genosqua or a Gugwe or something like that, you know, and even mountain giants twisting heads off one of the preferred methods of killing their prey. And this, maybe they're just leaving the body behind as, you know, like a, hey, stay the hell out of my territory sort of thing. Take the head with them for a little uh, trinket. We don't know. Um, and it's, you know, it doesn't look like there's been any move uh, with any intrepid explorers to want to get together a team to go explore it and find out for us, let us know about it. <laughs> uh, and it's just, it's just got a really nasty reputation. There's very, very little known about it, and people do their best to stay out of it. From what I understand, it's like a uh, some sort of a park or national forest or something up there, but uh, not very commonly visited. Don Ray was also asking about... Have there been have they been seen carrying clubs, sticks, or weapons? And I you know, one thing I can tell you is when you read a lot of old Native American reports, they will talk about these other things carrying clubs. Mm -hmm. What has your research found on that? In fact I have come across reports of that where they're they're using primitive weapons like you would think of, you know, like your stereotypical caveman carrying around your stone club or your uh, spear or something like that. And, um, you know, some, a couple, two, three of the reports from a lot further back even talk about them having to make sure clothing that's made out of, you know, multiple animal hides put together or something like that. And maybe that's what they're wearing during the colder seasons of the year. So it seems like they're, they have the attributes of being more intelligent, more tech savvy, than Bigfoot, you know, you never hear of uh, Bigfoot carrying a club around or using a stone axe or anything like that. And, uh, you know, if they do use uh, makeshift uh, stick tools like a chimpanzee or something like that, it isn't something that they're going to be carrying around with them all the time. So, uh, yeah, that actually does come up in some of the, the stories about them, which is, again, disturbing because they're that intelligent. What else do they know how to do? Um, one of the other things that comes up repeatedly is that they live underground. And I'm sure, you know, some of your listeners know about uh, some quotes where it says that in those days there were giants in the earth and also after. Now note that word in. They didn't say on. They didn't say there were giants on the earth. They said there were giants in the earth. And a bunch of the, a bunch of the reports of mountain giants allude to that sort of thing. Uh, there's been a couple of people even that have been captured by them reportedly and one of them escaped and said yeah it was a hidden underground cave that they had a secret entrance to it was something so massive that you know humans couldn't move it or even think that it could be moved so it could be an entrance to something and that's how they're coming and going and hiding it it makes me think of the lovelock caves uh, and for the listeners out there, I'm sure most people know the story, but the Native Americans, everyone always attributes that to Sasquatch. And I've always thought that was something else that they were killing off, but they were warring with this tribe of giants. And in the Lovelock Caves, the giants had gone into the cave, the Indians trapped them in there and basically burnt the entrance or burnt the inside of the cave, killed them all. What's interesting about what they pulled out of the Lovelock Caves is you'll see, going back to using primitive tools they had like uh, uh decoy ducks they pulled all mm -hmm. sorts of things out of that cave and you can see mm -hmm. pictures of it online and those when decoy you... ducks are excellent too those are excellent quality yeah it's like something today that would be made yeah exactly but i've always wondered if that was 
more of the mountain giants than Sasquatch because they talked about them being redheaded giants that mm-hmm. ate people that basically ate people and lived in mm-hmm. this cave. The stuff they're pulling out, you never hear about Sasquatch having duck decoys or you know these primitive tools. And uh, have you looked into that Lovelock Caves and related it to mountain giants? Yeah, actually, I did a lot of research on giants in North America in general when I got into opening this whole can of worms that had mountain giants in it to see if they were talking about the same thing or if it was something different. And I found sufficient evidence for me to think that there was actually two types of giants that weren't mountain giants that used to live here in North America, the red-headed giants being the more recent and reasonable and civilized version of you. <laughs> compared to the earlier ones, which were definitely Nephilim, who had double rows of teeth, six digits on hands and feet, as described by the local natives who fought them on the side of the red-headed giants. Uh, if I recall correctly, it's an Iroquois legend that they originally come from the West and that they were moving East for some reason. Well, the last time there was a big reason for that might have been some sort of a major volcanic event or something that made the, the western areas a little bit unlivable for a while. So some of the tribes moved east, and they got to uh, approximately where the Mississippi was, if I remember the story correctly, and they came up against the river and couldn't cross it because there was a, a hostile tribe on the other side. In fact, there was another tribe that was sitting right where they had come up, who had been there for a while, also wanting to cross the river and couldn't cross it because of the hostile tribe on the other side. And the tribe on the side of the river that they came up on were red-headed giants, seven to nine feet tall. And they said, hey, we'd like to go across, but these guys on the other side won't let us cross. They're really nasty, and uh, we just can't fight them by ourselves, so we're kind of stuck here. And the Iroquois went, well, we're not as big as you guys are, but there's lots of us. We'll team up with you if you want some help. Maybe between the two of us, we can get rid of them. And so according to the legend, the red-headed giants, and the, like I said, again, I think it's the Iroquois, uh, teamed up and, and went across the river Womp some serious butt on these big, nastier giants, and according to their legends, chased them down the, the Mississippi to the south, and they were never seen again. But yeah, I mean, it, all, it almost looks to me like the uh, the mound builders probably either were or were descendants of the red-haired giants, and the uh, the Nephilim were probably here even earlier than that. So again, the question arises: Where do the mountain giants fit into this whole thing? And I honestly don't think they do. I think there's something completely different that's, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a giant or a Sasquatch or what you are to them. You're just not any tougher than anything else, and it could still deal with you. Uh, you know, let's face it, a nine-foot-tall giant is still a pipsqueak compared to an 18-foot-tall monster. You could just squash them. I really don't think that they're related, but I do think, you know, for for those of you that are into the crazy conspiracy theories, there actually were two different kinds of giants that actually were here in North America before the... Uh, what we think of as the Native Americans today got here and uh, started dealing with them and <laughs> taking over everything. Don Ray, who's, who had a lot of questions on here, but one of the questions uh, he had asked about, has there been any reports of giants with one eyes? And, you know, going back to the Cyclops, it's been in our culture for a long time. Uh, what did the Cyclops do? Well, it ate people. It was this large giant that basically ate people. Uh, but have you had any, through your research, have you come across anything with, I guess what Don Ray's asking is, any reports of giants with one eye beyond the Cyclops that the Greeks talked about? I have not come across anything like that, no. I can't comment on it, uh, just, you know, I haven't come across anything that makes me think that the Cyclops uh, had any relation to uh, mountain giants or anything. In fact, a lot of uh, paleontologists now are leaning toward the idea that what they were finding actually was uh, uh, mammoth and mastodon skulls, and because the hole in the middle of the skull where the trunk goes, if you hold it upright, it looks like that's where a big giant eye should go. And that's what they were thinking they were finding was cyclops skulls when they were pulling these mastodon skulls out of the ground going, what the heck is this thing? Oh, look, it's got that big hole in the front of it. It must be a cyclops. But, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? The idea of the cyclops or them finding these things and then going, oh, that must have been a cyclops. You don't know. But as far as uh, reports of something like that in North America, uh, no, have not come across anything like that. I'd like to hear the report that you collected from Montana. Tell us about that one. Well, this one's uh, this one was actually collected by one of my uh, researchers who has now moved. And uh, this was just one of those serendipity things. He was... Uh, 
hanging out at, a, at the local Walmart waiting for a friend to come and pick him up. And while he was standing out in front having a cigarette, there was this older guy standing next to him, and they just struck up a conversation. And it turned out the guy that he was talking to was a retired logger who had spent pretty much his entire career right over here in the Bitter Rip Mountains being, you know, exactly what it sounds like, a logger, cutting down trees all the time. Um, he said, you know, that he had witnessed several strange things during the course of, you know, his career doing this, and he was retired at this point. For those of you who, are, who have been paying attention, you probably already have your alarm bells going off, because the Bauman story from Teddy Roosevelt and lots of other reports of aggressive Bigfoot encounters have been coming out of the same area for at least 150 years. Now, he claimed that he had seen Bigfoot, but beyond that, he related the following story. And I would have just written this story off as an utter hogwash, a tall tale, if it weren't for certain details that, again, start fitting into this pattern of, you know, what we're talking about with the mountain giants. This is near the end of the week. He had a logging crew that was finishing up in one area and making ready to move into another new area, one which had never been logged before, virgin forest. They had therefore sent in a cat to bulldoze a road into the area, along with a small crew to help. And by Friday afternoon, they had a road into the site and had some of their equipment there, two trucks, a number of chainsaws, several barrels of fuel, and the other kind of miscellaneous logging equipment that you expect from an operation like that. Now, when the crew returned Monday morning, they were in for a wee bit of a surprise, or a uh, major shock might be more. There were no new tire tracks on the road going in, so they know that nobody drove in there. I mean, this has just been bulldozed. It's, you know, muddy, dirty. Anything that walks across is going to leave a track. It's going to be obvious. No vehicles have gone in or out. So considering the distance in, they pretty much could rule out human pranksters on this one. Uh, when they arrived at the site, they first noticed that something had happened to the two trucks that they had left there. And by something I mean, both were smashed as though a crane had dropped a wrecking ball repeatedly on each one. One was on the ground, the suspension having given out during the massive impacts delivered by the mystery vandal. There was a huge chain, a heavy logging chain, which had been holding all the chainsaws together to a tree. It had been snapped. None of the chainsaws were missing. Each one of them was found. Each one of this blade wrapped around smaller trees in the area. All the fuel drums had been hurled down a ravine. Finally, there was a very obvious trail of destruction leading away from the area, which, according to him, and I quote, looked like a tank went through it, unquote. There were no signs of a vehicle having been there. Now, as the shocked and frightened men observed this trail of destruction and everything else that they were noticing around there, they noticed that on that trail of destruction there were monstrous tracks that were nearly three feet long and clearly displayed only four toes on each print. The logger, having gotten the message, decided to keep quiet about it and wisely abandoned the site, moving on to the next parcel they were allowed to log and vowing never to return to that area again. What the hell could do? Could Bigfoot do that? I don't think a regular Bigfoot could even do that. You know, and it, it once again, these giant tracks, or toes, very aggressive behavior, middle of nowhere in the mountains, fits all the other parameters of what we're talking about. The only thing we didn't get was a physical sighting of it. That's ter that's absolutely terrifying. Do you notice with these mountain giant reports that it's always f four toes? It's always four toes, yeah. And as a matter of fact, we've had some, some old ones that people have been trying to attribute to Bigfoot for a while now that if you look at the original versions of them, you would find out that the actual description is in there. You just have to dig far enough to find it. And they are talking about something with four toes. Get to one of them that I got here. But the Okefenokee uh, incident, uh, the Man Mountain of the Okefenokee Swamp. This is a famous one. Uh, there was two men and a boy. They went scouting in the swamp in an unusually dry year. And this is actually an understatement. It had been dry for like three or four years. The level of the swamp was way down. They figured this would be a great time to go in and map it because they'd never been able to get into the interior of it. And they were in there for several days and encountered 18 by 9 inch tracks. First of all, huge tracks. Secondly, note what we were talking about last week, the 100 and the 50% rule. The track is going to be 50% as wide as the entire, the entire length of it. So 9 and 9 is 18. 
It's 18 inches by 9. So that fits the parameters. The stride was a trifle over 6 feet. Again, that's a little bit on the big side for a Bigfoot track. Could still be a Bigfoot. Uh, however, these tracks, according to the description, actually had four toes. So again, you're talking about something a little bit different. Now, these, these people that found these tracks were so scared by the whole thing that they just went back out again and told their buddies, hey, we found tracks of something really weird in there, and we decided to get out. So a bunch of stout lads, <laughs> armed to the teeth with muskets, pistols, and sabers, party nine men decided that they would go in and find the monster. And uh, they were in there for a better part of a couple of weeks from what I understand. They found the track line again that had been described to them and they back trailed it and, uh, and then they forward trailed it and they figured they were coming closer up on where it was at at the point where they decided to make camp. And I guess a couple of them were messing around with their guns and fired a couple of rounds or something. And at that point, it came bursting out of the woods and attacked them. Five of the nine men died in the battle with it. They had their heads ripped off their bodies. Seven musket shots took the monster down. Lying dead on the ground, it was measured and found to be 13 feet tall. Again, four toes, gigantic size, extremely aggressive, tears heads off. Now, this to me looks like a report of a mountain giant, not the Bigfoot that has been attributed to for the last 150 years, practically. No longer than that. But, you know, there's a good example right there. You start looking at some of these reports from the olden days, especially really aggressive Bigfoot encounters, and you start coming up with some really strange stuff. It is interesting. You know, a lot of these old reports of, of Sasquatch, you do get a lot of aggressive reports. Generally, there's something initiated by it. Someone doesn't leave an area. They get stuff thrown at them. They stay there night after night after night, and then something happens, or they shoot at it, and something happens. But you do, there is a lot of old reports to where, just out of the blue, something sets this thing off. And I'm with you. I mean, sometimes you read some of those old reports, and you're like, are they talking about Sasquatch? Are they talking about something else? Like, you get lost on what they're talking about, because it kind of fits Sasquatch, but it kind of doesn't in, in, mm -hmm. in some of the details. And that's part of what you have to really look at, I think, is the, is the details. You know, did they get a look at the face? Did they describe it? How many toes did it have? What was it built like? You know, things like that. And you can start winnowing away the the Bigfoot reports from the Mountain Giant reports. You know, and it's not like I'm a fan of Bigfoot or anything, but I would rather not blame Bigfoot for something that maybe somebody else is doing. Yeah, and one of the questions one of the listeners had was, uh, do you think these things are human or do you think they are animal? Just your personal uh, opinion. My personal opinion, they're probably closer to being humans than any of the other sub-varieties of Bigfoot are. Now, just the tool used and the occasional sightings of them and makeshift clothing would seem to point in that direction. Plus, uh, you know, having the wherewithal to make secret hidden underground uh, layers that nobody else is going to be able to find. You know, Bigfoot may be using caves and stuff, but you don't get reports of them, like, covering the entrance of a boulder so nobody notices it or anything like that. Maybe they're doing it, but I just haven't seen the reports of it. And I would tend to agree with you. That's where I was lost on some of the old reports, uh, especially with some of the Native Americans. When they talk about these mountain giants, uh, they'll say they were people. They're a tribe of people that are just giant, uh, and they're cannibalistic, and they're monsters. And uh, Sometimes you talk to Native Americans, and when they talk about Sasquatch, they'll talk about it as being an animal, not necessarily a person. And I think that's sometimes where... And I, and I could be wrong, but I, sometimes when you read these old reports, are the natives talking about Sasquatch being a person? Or are they talking about being an animal? And then you read these mountain giant reports that they're talking about, and they're they're describing them as gigantic, cannibalistic people. Yeah. Yeah, that's sort of disconcerting, too, because you can almost understand if these, these things are animals and occasionally they eat humans. Maybe they just don't know any better, but they have more of an attribute of... Uh, sentient intelligence along the lines of the way we think of it for them than any of the other subspecies or any of the legends that go along with them. So it's, you know, it's really disconcerting. It's like, well, the smarter they are, the more dangerous they are and the more aggressive they are. This, this is just not really a good thing. So again, you know, you can't, you can't fit these things into the box of, uh, of Bigfoot, you know, thinking that, well, there's a certain way that Bigfoot acts and there's a certain way that he hunts and da-da-da-da-da. We don't know doodly about these things. We don't know how they hunt. 
we don't know it's you know what level of technology they have or communication or anything. There's just so little information available on them. We barely even know that they exist. I mean, you know, uh, we're doing the best we can to gather information on them, but for the time being, there's just there's not a whole lot known. And in the interest of information, let me give you guys some stats. Here's some tracks that have been found from all the giants. Cold Lake, Alberta, June 1976, 21 by 10 inches. Uh, Snoqualmie, Washington, January 1976, 17 by 8 inches. Astoria, Oregon, December 1977. 17 by 7.5 inches. Tracks up to 24 by 12 inches have been found at four toes of about equal size on them. The Long Beach, California Independent of November 28, 1941 reported that Fort Douglas, British Columbia was being terrorized by an enormous Sasquatch. Jimmy Douglas and his family, who sighted the behemoth, claimed it was at least 14 feet tall about twice as tall as a normal member of a Sasquatch species. And again, keep in mind, here's the words, being terrorized. It's not just hanging around the area, it's terrorizing people. In Newfoundland in the 1890s, William Decker was hunting along the Pistolet Bay when a giant man-like creature charged him in a marsh. It took three shots to kill it, and the hair-covered body was measured at 12 feet, the outstretched arm span 14 feet. And Bill estimated its weight at about 1,000 pounds. He left it where it fell. While I was in a swamp, he was by himself. How's he going to drag it out again? And then some of these other ones, you have to be, you know, sort of careful. Like, a lot of people would immediately jump on and go, well, the Lafleur incident is probably mountain giants then, too, isn't it? No. I really think that was the Genosco one to go by. that did that one. And, uh, you know, again, it's not, it's not like a Bigfoot, but it's not like a mountain giant. It's that in-between territory where if you've read enough of the reports of the same sort of critter, there's the same sort of behavior, and, you know, very reprehensible behavior. There's a reason that a lot of the, the natives describe them as having revolting habits because they had quite the variety of them, apparently. So, you know, there's some more examples right there. These, these things are found. There are stories about them. They're just rare enough that most people tend to overlook them, and it hasn't really been paid much attention to until fairly recently. And part of the reason for this is because the uh, the contents of a lot of these old newspapers that was only available on microfiche is finally being put into a digital format so you can access it from a computer, which means it's a lot easier for researchers to go and look at all of these old reports and put up keywords like wild man, yahoo, giant, da 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 and see what they come up with. And they're starting to find some of these old reports that had been completely forgotten. Nobody even knew that they were out there. And it's happening day by day, month by month, more and more of these are being found and more and more of it's being put up on the Internet. So it's making it easier, actually, for us to, to go through all this information and be able to find these you know, reports that have got these similar details to them that match up to this sort of thing. In my mind, this seems very unnatural, doesn't it? I mean, does this seem like natural to you? No, it doesn't. It seems very, very odd. And you know, some of the other attributes that are that are given to them, it's uh, it's believable that there could be uh, relic hominids from the ice age that are maybe closer related to the pongid great apes that might have even become carnivorous. That's fairly believable. That could happen. I could see that happening. Um, Twenty-foot-tall humanoids with tusks that you know are like carnivores, but still use tools, and it all seems just very, very strange. And if it wasn't for the really, you know, again, all of, all of the the reports that we've got and the pictures that we've got of the tracks and whatnot, to collaborate that yes, those things really are out there. I mean, my God, I wouldn't believe it for a second. You know, it's just so far-fetched and so weird. It doesn't fit it seem to fit into what we know about. Um, natural science and natural selection that could create a creature like that. Diana M. asks, Hey Duke, do you have any further information on the alleged mummified finger Swiss archaeologist uh, Gregor, I think it's Sapporo, of 1988 photo taken during the private trip to Egypt? I don't know if you've seen that or not. But oh, I know what she's talking. Yes, I have seen that one. I know what she's talking about. No, I don't have any more information on that. That looks like a standard giant's finger, though, to me. And, you know, unless you've got uh, some way to get a, a, a sample of it, DNA test it to see that it's actually something real, uh, that's pretty much where you're going to have to leave it at this point. 
Yeah, and for the audience out there that haven't seen it, uh, I'll post it under this episode. But basically, it's a uh, mummified finger. I think it's three times, the, was it three times or four times the size of a normal finger? Yeah, it's gigantic. I know that. I remember seeing the, the photograph of it, too. And it looks like a standard mummified finger, only just ridiculously big, way outside the, the limits of what a human finger could be. Russell S. asks, uh, I just listened to Duke's interview again. It was a Bell Creek area in southeast Montana. It's been a few years since I've been out that way, but isn't that high prairie? I'm curious where a giant like that would hide out that way. Is there forest somewhere in that area? I lived in Montana for a number of years, twice actually, so I'm very interested in the topic in that location. Yeah, honestly, I don't think that it lived in that area. I think they just caught him moving through the area, and uh, he figured he could safely do it during the cover of a storm. Nobody would know. You know. What humans are going to be out wandering around at 2 o'clock in the morning during a thunderstorm, right? <clears throat> but, uh, no, I, I don't think that they live in the area. And, and you know, Belt Creek Canyon, Canyon, waterway. They follow waterways. So he was moving from point A to point B, from where to where, I don't know. But that's my theory. I, I really don't see that being an area that they can live in, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, I, 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 and I don't know the area that well. And he's right. It is mostly like high plains, and it's just, you know, got a, uh, some canyons cut through it and whatnot. It's not, uh, it's not amenable to uh, any creature like that actually living in the area long-term on a regular basis or anything, but it would make a great... Uh, uh, trackway for them to go from point A to point B, especially if they're doing it at night. The one from Idaho, What? Um, what how long ago did that encounter happen? January 29th, 1902. Um, and the, uh, the story actually comes from the Dubuque Telegraph Herald, and it mentions that in the little town of Chesterfield, Idaho, an isolated area of Bannock County, Someone there had encountered an eight-foot-tall, hair-covered monster who gave them quite the fright. Okay, well, this sounds like a standard Bigfoot report. Eight-foot-tall, hair-covered monster. People are scared. On January 14th, the monster appeared to a group of youngsters who were skating on the river. Whether in an area shoveled clear of snow or if, in fact, the entire river was clear of it, we're not told. What is reported, however, is that the creature was acting aggressively, brandishing a large club. Aha, wait, there's a clue. Bigfoot doesn't brandish clubs, he throws sticks. Uttering a series of yells, it started to attack the skaters. Now, none of them have fired at it or anything. They're just out there skating. And the skaters, who owing to having skates on, of course, used them to uh, dart quickly to their wagons and get safely away from the thing. Now, Bigfoot are not known to be aggressive in general, although they certainly can be when the time it calls for it. And they're definitely not known to go after a group of humans. Maybe one lone person, or maybe even two, but a group? That's even more unusual. Okay, not to mention the wielding of a large club. We already went into that. None of this behavior fits in with what's usually reported in Bigfoot sightings, but all of it fits in with the violent behavior and tool use described as mountain giants and in the reports on them. Um, so what do you make of the beast's eight-foot height, then? Well, consider this now. A youngster of that species would be about that height and still green enough to think it could catch skating humans in a group and get away with it, a task at which it obviously failed miserably. The story then goes on to relate that upon their return, tracks were found. These tracks were 22 inches long and 7 inches wide and had four toes. Now, can you picture a creature 8 foot tall with 2 foot long feet? No, it doesn't make sense. That's the hominid equivalent of a snowshoe hare. Try drawing that and see how silly it looks. But now wait, those tracks were not found at the sighting. They were found along the range to the west of the river. Now my guess is that what happened is a junior there broke the rules, chased some humans, and whether from anger or for fun, and Mama or Daddy showed up, heard the ruckus he was making, knew what the humans would likely do, and came to drag Junior away leaving behind a very obvious and enormous four-toed tracks later discovered. Yeah, and it, these reports are amazing because it's they're from different time periods, and you kind of get the same story from different time periods. That's what makes me stop and kind of look at this and go, well, maybe there's something to this. That's what got my attention in the first place, Wes. I started seeing enough of these things with the same kind of details to go, well, just wait a minute now. Are they 
this this just doesn't sound like Bigfoot. And you go and you look at the names that the natives had for him, and you know we talked about this a couple times already that some of the weird names for him just does not sound like they're describing a typical Bigfoot or even a Janosko uh, Wendigo or you know Gugwe or any, anything like that. They're they're too huge, they're too aggressive. They got different attributes. These tools, you know, they've got these underground layers that they can hide in, and da 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 da. Right down the line, it's all so different from what you normally hear of the descriptions of, you know, stick man and basket woman, and, you know, things like that from the, the, the Northwest where the, the Bigfoot are, are assumed to be shy, retiring, and fairly neutral, and occasionally they'll bug you and steal your fish, but usually they want to leave you alone and they want to be left alone. And These things are, no, you get anywhere near them, they try and kill you and eat you. You know, this is a completely different kind of critter that they're talking about. And frankly, thank God they're rare. There's been some other strange things that have been attributed to these things. I actually got someone to talk to someone who lives in an area where apparently there is one nearby. And he's seen it at one point, and he said that it could blend. And I pressed for details, and I said, what does blend mean? And the person that got the report said he, was, he, he didn't have the right words to describe what he had saw, and that was the closest thing he could come up with. And then I thought of the reports of Bigfoot being able to cloak, you know, and whenever I hear the word cloak, I think of like a Romulan cloaking device or something, you know, like Bigfoot can just like turn invisible or something like that. You know, how can, so, how, how can something like that be happening? But then you hear the word blend, and it starts making you think of something or maybe along the lines of camouflage. Well, right about the same time that I got this information, I got information from a completely different quarter where they had found in a uh, hair that they couldn't figure out what the origin was. It didn't match with any animals that they knew. And as usual with the Bigfoot type hairs, it didn't have enough of a follicle in it to be able to do anything with it as far as DNA testing. It just wasn't even there. But it had one really unusual property. If you looked at it at a distance, it looked like it was gray. But if you put it up next to something with a color, it would actually pick up that color and reflect it. So if you put it next to a green tree, it would look green. If you put an extra brown dirt, it would look brown. Now, is this what he was talking about when he was saying blending? Maybe these things have this sort of semi-transparent hair that can pick up the color of whatever it is that they're standing next to. And, you know, let's face it, when you're out in the woods, you're not looking for a 15 to 20 foot tall hominid. Your brain is not programmed to look for something like that. All these things really have to do is stand still next to a tree and we're just going to walk right past and not even notice them. How often do people look up? I mean, our eyesight is going to be at like their knee level. You know, they stand still. All we see is a couple of tree trunks. And the other thing about reports of these things, there may be more people that have seen these things than we actually realize and just have not reported it. Because if you see, you know, with all the media exposure at this point, if you see some hairy thing that's eight feet tall, run across the road in the middle of the night when you're on your way home, you might actually tell some of your friends. You might eventually decide that you're going to tell somebody about this because you've heard of Bigfoot and you know, maybe this is one of those Bigfoot things that people are talking about. But you see some 15-foot tall monster with tusks go running across the road in front of you in the middle of the night. Who are you going to tell about it? No, you're absolutely right. And that the few reports I've taken of, of something that's outside of the range of Sasquatch or the normal range, uh, none of those people wanted to come on the air. Uh, they just... Mm-hmm. They were like, "Hey, look, I, I don't know what it was, but here's you know." And they don't. You're right because Sasquatch is starting to become more acceptable. More and more people have seen them, but I think there would be a higher ridicule factor if someone said, "Hey, I was up in Alaska and I saw an 18 foot tall thing with tusks." Most people are going to blow you off and just say, "Well, you you were smoking or you were drinking, you were you know, kind of what they used to do to people yeah. who saw Sasquatch." I wanted to ask you. One of the things with the hair, where did they find the hair? I honestly don't remember. I have to go back and dig up that information, but I can come up with it for you if you're really uh, interested in that. I got it from one, another one of my Bigfoot friends who had actually seen the report and was telling me about it. And uh, that's where I put two and two together and hopefully came up with something that might approximate a right answer on this one. Well, I'm kind of glad you brought that up because I did read something like that a while back, and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. It, they, it was something exactly how you described the hair. They said it was kind of a clear hair, and when you put it up next mm-hmm. to something, it takes on that color of whatever it is, which is strange, and it might explain the cloaking. So, you know, not I don't think everyone's lying about the cloaking thing. I think people either they're running into demonic entities or 
they're running into something. Um, and mm-hmm. when they talk about this, uh, you know, everyone seems to have the answer. Well, Sasquatch and Cloak. Well, you know what? Maybe you ran into something else. Um, yeah. With regard to the... Me- well, or go ahead. Well, I, I was going to say there's definitely that where, you know, you've got misidentification or... And and I lean toward this one in quite a few reports where I don't think it's Bigfoot or any of the subrise that you saw. I think it was something else trying to make you think you saw Bigfoot. You know, for whatever, you know, getting giggles out of the silly humans falling for it, whatever it is that, that they're trying to do. You know, I really think that there are some entities out there that get their jollies out of pranking humans or terrifying them. And they're more than willing to, you know, pick your brain and go, ah, you believe in Bigfoot. I'll make myself look like a Bigfoot, you know, um, or, or a dogman, a werewolf, you know, whatever they think is going to get the most of a reaction out of you. You know, when I was talking to Rocky Elmore, he was telling me about one night, uh, and everyone has listened to the show knows the story, uh, but they were out uh, up in the hills of Ote Mountain, and they came across this airman. And he said the air, it, it was an airman from like 1940. The uniform looked like he was, I actually think it was during the day, Rocky said he saw it. And he was wondering oh what this guy's doing out here. And so as they're pulling up, it's obviously not an illegal alien, but it's an, it looked like an airman from the 40s. And as right. they pull, pulled up to this guy, uh, Rocky stops a truck and he's going to get out and ask the guy if he needs help or, you know, what's he doing up here? Uh, and he said the the airman turned back and looked at him and smiled this real creepy smile, and then he was gone. He just vanished. And I said, "Well, yeah. was it was it like a ghost? Did you see when you originally?" Saw? He goes, "No, it it was very much like a flesh and blood man walking." And he goes, "There was two of us, two border patrol agents. We both saw this guy, and he turns and he gives me this creepy grin, and then he's gone." He goes, I don't know what to make of it. I guess he did some research later, and I guess a, a plane had gone down back in the 40s, and a bunch of airmen died out there. But you're right. I mean, you can run into – you start seeing weird stuff, and I'm not saying I have all the answers because I, I – believe me, I don't. Uh, but me there either. Is... Let me go on the record as saying that. I am not an expert. <laughs> I do not have all the answers. Anybody that tells you they're an expert on Bigfoot is lying. There is no such thing. Yeah, no, I, but you know, and it's just one of those things to where, you know, when people say the weird stuff they run into, uh, I'm always quick to caution them. Well, you know what? That might be something else that you're seeing. That might be a different entity you don't want to mess with uh, Mm -hmm. because things just don't vanish. Things just don't disappear. And everyone says, well, we don't know anything about quantum physics. Well, you know what? Uh, I doubt that. Yeah, actually, we do know quite a bit about it. We just we're not super expert, but we know quite a bit about it. And there's, you know, anything. <clears throat> the uncertainty principle says anything is possible. However, uh, there's a lot of things that are incredibly unlikely, and are probably never going to happen within our lifetimes, and some of them not even in the lifetime of our universe. So. You know, let's just throw that red herring out the window to start with. That's just kind of a cop-out right there. And some of the other stuff that people attribute to Bigfoot as having powers or anything, you know, like, well, it's, you know, there you see these swamp lights, the will-o'-the-wisps, the orbs and stuff around the same areas as Bigfoot. How do you know that has anything to do with Bigfoot? Maybe Bigfoot's looking at him like we are, going, what the hell are those things? I'm out of here. You know, you don't know. Yeah. You don't know that that has anything to do with Bigfoot. Another one that you get is, well, Bigfoot can... Can float. I got in an argument with somebody here a couple of weeks ago about that, and it's, you know, like they were trying to say basically Bigfoot could levitate. I'm like, dude, if Bigfoot can levitate, how is it that we have any casts of any footprints from any Bigfoot ever? Because why would they leave tracks so they could just levitate? Okay. Well, I've seen them floating through the forest before. Well, are you describing the way they walk, which looks like somebody that's cross country skiing because their head doesn't bob up and down? Is that what you mean by floating? Because then you're correct. They look like they're floating. Are they actually floating? No. So you have to be careful of the descriptions you're getting from people because sometimes their English is just inelegant and they're using the wrong word to try and describe what it is that they're trying to say. But at other times, they're simply letting themselves be misled by their misperception of what's actually going on. Uh, not a fan of the flute players out there, folks. Sorry about that. I just uh, don't don't buy the Bigfoot has uh, amazing paranormal powers and can pass through portals and 
shift into other dimensions and turn invisible and read your mind and fly to the moon and come back with a unicorn. And I don't believe any of it. Sorry. Uh, it's too much of a realist. I wouldn't even believe in Bigfoot if I had seen one. So there you go. I'm a horrible, horrible skeptic. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> no, I, I'm with you on that. It, you know, sometimes you have to, um, it, with like the portal thing, you know, it's like, well, how do you know it was a portal? Like, are you an expert on portals? I mean, if when someone says, hey, I saw a light, and this is what, I remember I took a report one time from a, um, it was people who, who claimed it was a dog man. But before seeing the dog man, they saw a light flash out of the forest. And they don't know what the light was. They they can't describe what it was. But it happened right before. It could have been a completely something completely separate. And it's easier to talk to someone when they just describe what they saw. Don't tell me that it was a portal because you don't know what a por- what is a portal. You know, is it yeah. to other dimensions? Or now you're an expert on portals. But it, you know, a lot of these more legitimate people that'll tell you things will say, "Well, I don't know what it was. It was a light of some sort." Uh, like the orb thing, uh, I got more more emails about orbs than I ever wanted in my life. And I had just mentioned it one time on the show. I can tell yeah. you exactly how long I talked about it. I talked about it for a minute, 27 seconds. And, and, <laughs> and you know that exactly how long that was? Why, Wes? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was shocked. I was completely shocked. I mean, I got so many... Uh, people that listen to the show where they're like, hey, I've never seen a Sasquatch, but that orb thing you mentioned, that ball of light, I've seen that. Mm -hmm. And I have no explanation for it, but I've seen that. And I mean, people just came out of the woodwork. And I, you know, I didn't really know much about orbs. I've never seen one. And I was just blown away by how many people. uh, It's kind of like the one kid in class, you know, I, I mentioned it for a moment. And all of a sudden everyone is like, oh yeah, you know what? I've seen that too. And one of the things I wanted to uh, talk to you about well, let me ask you this. Was there more information on the mountain giants before I move on to this other topic? Well, one thing that I think that we should uh, bring up that bears mentioning is that one of the ways that you can differentiate them from the quote-unquote normal giants, and in this case, let's say red-haired giants and have one. You know, uh, they've got body hair that covers all of them. That's one way that you can tell that they're different. We've already mentioned several other ones. Now, I don't know if this is true in the reports that you got, Wes, but the ones that I've got where it's actually mentioned, they not only have the boar-like tusks coming out of their lower jaw, but they also have claws on their hands and feet, just like the description of the Wendigo. I'm trying to remember that report I took. I I think he did say it had claws. It was a while back I took that report. Uh, Mm -hmm. But, again, I didn't know what to do with it at that point. But I, I think he did mention it had claws. Yeah, that's one of those things. You get a report with all these weird attributes to it, and you're just like, this is so far off. There's just no way. Come on, man. And then you run into another one that's like from 100 years ago on the other side of the country, and they're talking about the same exact thing. And you're like, well, wait a minute. What, what What's going on here? They, these two people are making up the same crazy story 100 years apart. Was that possible? You know. And then you start finding more of them and more of them and more of them. It's you know it's beyond the point where there's a reasonable expectation that we're really talking about a real critter here. I mean, you know, tracks don't lie. He, something made him. If it was a hoaxer, a hoaxer made him. If it was an actual animal, an animal made him. Something makes tracks. And when you've got tracks that look really, really real, and they've only got four toes on them, what hoaxer is going to go out and make four-toed tracks? Seriously, think about it. Who the hell knows that there are four-toed tracks? Now, you guys know, but until very recently, very few people. So it's not something a hoaxer is going to set out to go, oh, I'm going to make four-toed Bigfoot tracks. And da, 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 da. No, you're going to make five-toed Bigfoot tracks like everybody else makes, and you're going to think that's what Bigfoot's feet look like, because that's what they do look like. They have five toes. Why are you going to make four-toed tracks? Yeah, and again, I, the guy, uh, the reports I've taken about with these mountain giants, I didn't get a sense from any of these people they were lying about what they saw. I mean, I didn't... I just didn't know what to do with the information. You know, I took it and I was like, well, I, I believe this. I, I believe them. I, I think they, they saw something. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think that the Boggy Creek monster, I believe, had four-toed tracks? Do you think that was just a Sasquatch that was inbred, or do you think it was related to these mountain giants, like a juvenile? 
Yeah, I'd have to look into that one more. I was actually unaware that it was a four-toed track. I'd heard about the uh, three-toed tracks on the one swamp monster that they had down there with uh, uh, Harlan or whoever it was, the one guy that they were accused of uh, hoaxing and making three-toed tracks. And, uh, and yeah, I've heard reports of those you know, three- and four-toed tracks being found down there. It's possible. You know, it's certainly possible that they're if they're in an area that's very built up and has very many humans in it, really unlikely. They would need to be out in an area where it's really, really deserted. For animals that big, they need to have a really large area in order to feed themselves, and they wouldn't want to be around anywhere. They could potentially be running into humans or be spotted by them. So you can pretty much eliminate the ones that are anywhere near civilized areas is probably not, you know, mountain giants. Um, misidentified Bigfoot or something like that. You know, and on the, su- the subject of polydactylism, um, they're really... Inbreeding will cause multiple toes, not less toes. So for people that think that three-toed and four-toed Bigfoots are a result of inbreeding, that is absolutely genetically backwards. Um, if you inbreed too much, you will get more toes and fingers rather than less. I'm kind of glad you brought that up. Because uh, you're right, you actually get more digits, more digits, not not less, with inbreeding, uh, and you can see a lot of that online. I wanted to ask you about the different types of Sasquatch, and I, and I want to run this past past you. I've never talked about this on the air. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. I think you know, okay. I think you know where I'm going, Duke. Uh, you Uh-oh. and I've talked talked about it off the air, uh, and it's it's always. This has always bothered me. I don't know if it's misinformation that I'm being given or if it's um, legitimate information. But just like the mountain giants, just like Sasquatch, sometimes when you're given information, there's stuff I've been told in the past by people in the military and whatnot. And I've I've always just kind of put it on the shelf like, well, that's interesting, but I, I don't know what you want me to do with that. And I've, you know, with these different types of Sasquatch, do you think it's a genetically altered DNA splicing that's going on with the military? And I'll go into it more in a, in a moment, but I wanted to get your take. Do you think these different types are DNA manipulation and it's just kind of a freak show that's being created out there? I've heard those rumors too, and I've you know probably heard some of the same things that you've heard, Wes. And my take on the whole thing is if... The military with their technology is doing this. No question with the, the technology we've got nowadays, if you give you know, give them enough budget, they can create almost anything. You can cross a plant with an animal, and, or you can make, a, like we were talking about, you can make a goat give milk that's got spider webs in it, so you can make extra strong body armor out of it. And by putting one of the genes from the, the spider into the goat so that its milk produces spider web. So, I mean, you could do genetically all sorts of weird things. Now... But all the types of Bigfoot, the sub-varieties that have been described and that are being seen by people, all fall into categories of things that have been named by the local Indian tribes living in those areas and for hundreds of years. So if the government was creating these, uh, you know, uh, DNA monsters, um, how did they send them back in time? Because these things have been spotted for way before there was even white men here, and uh, they just seem to be indigenous to the area, you know, were they, were they created, are they synthetic beings? Well, if they are, they weren't created by our science, let's put it that way, unless at some point in the past we had a tech level equivalent to what we have right now, and uh, giant disaster, Atlantis sinking, uh, you know, glaciation, whatever you want to ascribe it to, um, wiped all the technology out, and then we had to start at scratch and, and build everything back up again. Then I could see it as being an excuse for where these things came from. But um, current technology making them, okay, well, then why were they around hundreds of years ago? If they are making monsters like that now, they're being, they're being extremely vigilant about keeping a lid on it because they're not getting loose where anybody can spot one of them and go, hey, I saw this thing, and it's not a Bigfoot, and it looked like this which, again, we'd probably file into the wacky reports that don't make any sense. But at some point, we'd look at it and go, well, what was it they were trying to describe here? This doesn't fit in with anything else that we're seeing. 
and it's, you know, honestly, Wes, it's been a while since I've encountered anything that's even remotely Bigfoot related, and I can't stick into one of the sub variety categories that I know of at this point. So, you know, unless there's there is good evidence that some other, you know, intelligent beings had some interest in doing something like this, or we ourselves did it at some unguessably long point in the past before our technology crumbled, our civilization fell, and then we had to start all over again. I don't see how they could have done it. Yeah, and that's always been my argument with it. I, you know, I've talked to, and for people who glazed over what Duke just said there, look up that goat that was the DNA was mixed with the spider. Uh, it's it's pretty disturbing uh, to watch online. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so if you, no it, if you get a chance, check that out. You can YouTube it and, and see exactly what Duke mentioned. But, you know, I've talked to – this goes back uh, about a year and a half ago uh, or maybe two years ago. I talked to a special forces guy uh, one time, and you always get a little bit of information from – well, he claimed to be special forces – and I think he was. One of the things I can tell you about people in the military, I never served, uh, but one of the things I can tell you from talking to people in the military is they talk in acronyms, and it's almost like another language. And unless you know what acronym they're talking about, you have no clue what – it's almost like uh, Spanish. Um, and he was on one of these kill teams, and he was describing to me how they killed him. Uh, and I said, well, is it an area that you guys are going into – because of um, these creatures are killing people? Is it? And he's like, well, no. Uh, we kill them in the field. He's like, there's a scientist. There's, and he went through and explained to me the whole thing. And he basically said that when we kill them, uh, we'll take certain organs out right there in the field, and then we'll airlift them out. And I said, well, where are they taking them to? And he said, I don't know. That's not my job. My job is to, I'm the trigger man. I shoot them. Uh, and he kind of explained it. You know, again, I've never served. He said, you know, in, in the military, each person has their own little job. And you don't really, you unless you need to know, they're not going to tell you. Uh, so he didn't know where they were airlifting them out. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that was interesting when him and I talked, because I had a hard time buy, buying into the dogman thing. And he said, when people tell you about the dogman, they're not lying to you. Uh, they're absolutely uh, a creation uh, of, he said they were a genetically altered creation that is out there. That was it was created by us. It goes back to weaponizing these things, and but he didn't really he didn't have a ton of information. So I just put it on the that's interesting shelf and right. left it there. And I've never said anything on the air about it. Well, I talked to about a year after that. I talked to another person who claimed to be in the military. And they were telling me about, they were more on the other side of it, not the kill team, but more on the other side of it. And he said, you know, Wes, you're right about a lot of things, but you're wrong on a lot of things. And I said, <laughs> and I said well, what do you mean? And uh, this person said that, I'm trying to think how to say this. Um, he said these things aren't people. And they're not really animals. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, the original ones weren't created by, they aren't natural, or if you want to say by God, but they're not natural. And the original ones weren't created by man. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, he said, the a lot of these subspecies that people are seeing, they are absolutely a genetic creation. And he's, you know, he shared all kinds of information. Like they have three different vocal cords, and one of the vocal cords is 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 a human vocal cord. And uh, but he said that anyone that gets DNA, any any geneticist that's worth their weight uh, that runs DNA on these things, they won't be able to make heads or tails of it. It'll make no sense when they run the DNA. He said you'll get Neanderthal DNA, you'll get human DNA, and you'll get about three different primates in a lot of these species. And he said, let me, he said, let me, let me ask you something. Do you really think the lumber industry has that powerful of lobbyists to keep Sasquatch under wraps? Do you think the government really cares for one moment that these things come out? It would just crush the lumber industry. He goes, do you really believe that? And, you know, it kind of made me stop and think about some things 
especially with this being covered up. But he said, once you open this, once you open this subject, it opens Pandora's box. Yeah. And there's a lot of other things that will come out that are tied to this. And they don't want us to know about it. And that's for sure. Well, and he gave me all sorts of information. And I've heard this about three times uh, with different lights that you use to stop them. He said, red lights don't bother them. Uh, blue and green lights bother them. And, you know, and I've heard this about three or four times uh, from people claiming mm-hmm. to be in the know. Uh, but they shared a lot of information with me. And, you know, I look at it and I'm like, is this disinformation? Are they wanting me to go on air and talk about this so I look like a fool? Or is this real information? And I'm not subscribing to any of this for people listening. I'm just letting you know some of the information that I've never shared before. You know, one of the things I, I asked about a year ago, I talked to a guy. Uh, that was part of the kill teams. And I asked him, well, how do you bring him in? I said, what do you guys go out there and do calls? I mean, what, how do you guys actually bring these things in when you're not tracking them down? Uh, and he talked cool. about this weapon that they use. And it's a frequency weapon. And there's a certain hertz that you use, and it drives these things crazy. And they'll come in, and then they'll the controller will shoot them. Uh, but he, I mean, he used different terms, different phrases. And I just wanted to get your opinion on it. I've, again, I've never shared it on air, but I've gotten so much information from several sources. Uh, and they all are kind of saying the same thing. I mean, it's not like one guy's way out in left field. Uh, they're all right. kind of saying the same thing. And some of the DNA stuff they talk about, you know, he said, you know, this DNA and geneticist, uh, genetics, he goes, do you think that's a creation from the 90s? And we're just now figuring out in the 2000s. He goes, let me tell you something. That's been around for a long, long, long time. Uh, and they have it down to a science now. They can crossbreed just about anything with anything. You know, and that opens a whole other part, a horrible Pandora box, too, which is <clears throat> if these things did have a synthetic origin and somebody in the past made them, they had the equivalent science to what we're talking about here. Uh, who's to say that some of these other mythological creatures weren't actually hideous genetic constructs and things like uh, hydras or, uh, you know, a chimera or uh, a dragon or, you know, God, think of any mythological weird critter. Can you make it with genetic science? Well, virtually the answer is yes in almost all of them. You know, so it's... <laughs> The thing that I like to think of when I get to sort of information is that it, it may or may not be true, but how do you vet something like this? Other than somebody else who is in the know in the same position that could verify this information, and anybody that's in that position is by virtue of being in that position not supposed to be giving you this information. So how can you trust that the information that you're getting is actually accurate, regardless of the fact that you got multiple people telling you the same thing? Because if this is a counterintelligence op, they're going to have multiple people telling you the same thing to make it more believable. So it may even be true, but how do we vet something like that to actually determine if it is or not? And that's what I'm And that's saying. my biggest problem. That's why I've never said anything on the air, uh, because I, I, you know, I can say this all day long on the air. Well, I talked to this guy, I talked to that guy, I talked to... But I haven't... No, you're right, there's no way to vet it. There's no way to... One of the things that makes me think some of it might be true, you hear so many unnatural things. I had a guy on Friday, uh, a gentleman who they were spotlighting in Texas. He said this thing stood up and it took off running and it ran about 40 miles an hour. Now, I don't know too many things that can get up and run on uneven ground at 40 miles an hour. It just, it, I'm starting to feel like it's more and more unnatural in the sense of, some of the things that they do, like running at 40 miles an hour, you know, I mean, with these things, I don't know. Apes can't run at 40 miles an hour. And yeah. so you hear some of the stuff, and I don't know. Well, wait now. Let's think about this for a minute. Though. How how fast can a human run? What's the top speed for a human? Do you, do you know that right off the top of your head? Well, me, it's about two miles an hour. <laughs> well, me, it's considerably less than that. So if you ever have to run from Bigfoot, make sure I'm around because you won't have to run very fast in order to get away. But uh, if you take the, you know, let's not even say an Olympic, uh, you know, just your your average person. Can your average person, if they have, if they're really hard-pressed, can they run at, say, like 20 miles an hour for a short distance? 
probably not. You know, maybe they can run. Well, ten is pretty slow. That's pretty easy to do. Fifteen miles an hour. Let's let's you know, I'll just say fifteen miles an hour. So if you got somebody that's really really athletic, maybe they can do twenty miles an hour. Now, if you make them twice as tall, they're taking twice as long a stride each step. Maybe they can run forty miles an hour. Yeah, that makes sense. I'll, I'll buy into that. I'm not saying it's the actual answer and that it's true, but I'm just, you know, I'm throwing other things out there. I give you other things to, you know, just to, to think about because anytime you get one of these weird things to think about, you should try and think of every single option you can possibly think of that could, that could fit into the parameters of what it, what it is that you're hearing that might be able to explain it. And some of me will be able to use Occam's razor and go, this is just so far-fetched that it's really unlikely and discard that silly idea. And, and usually it comes down to whatever makes the most sense. What's, you know, what's the most common sense reason that you could come up for it being this way? It's generally the right answer. Yeah, and that's a that's a one problem I have with the big cover-up. Why is there such a big cover-up? You know, I've said in the past, yeah. if, you know, is this really that crazy as a subject? If you don't believe me, you don't believe my encounter, that's fine. Would you like to hear a judge tell you his encounter? Would you like to hear a doctor tell you his encounter? Uh, I got several police officers that'll tell you their encounter. I got people in the military that'll tell you yeah. their encounter. Why the big cover up on this thing? You know, and one of the things one of the guys said to me, he goes, I know you and your brother are really wanting to shoot one, take its head off. He goes, You'll never make it down to the media. If you think that uh, we actually live in a free country and the media is not controlled by the government, he goes, I got another thing to tell you. Uh, it'll never happen. It just won't, it, it won't happen. And he, you know, according to him, these things have been shot several times by hunters, have been shot several times, not people in the military, but actually have been shot. And so, you know, you're right, man. I, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole with this. I just wanted to share, I guess, <laughs> with the audience and with you, some of the things that have been shared with me that I've never talked about on air. And again, I'm not subscribing to it, but I guess take right. take it for what what it is. Take it for what you want it want it to be. You know, it's odd. Well, in a program where our main subject of conversation is a uh, you know 18 foot tall, six thousand pound carnivorous behemoth, uh, I think we could talk about just about any possibility and uh, and then be right in the same ballpark with it. I mean, uh, you know, some of this stuff is just so far out there until you really do a bunch of research on it it's so hard to believe it could even be true and uh, you know when you find enough evidence to start believing it is true it's frankly it's just frightening as hell um, I don't like to be in a world where there's mountain giants running around out in the middle of nowhere and you have to worry about those damn things if you're out there that you know uh, not really digging that idea when I was up at Coloma when those tracks were discovered down uh, doing our little four day foray this summer uh, you know, we had something respond to the tree knocks that I did that came up and shook my tent. And, you know, was it a Bigfoot or was it a mountain giant? Well, I didn't get out of the tent to find out. <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, could have easily been either one. Uh, you know, suffice to say that that was probably not some lone rancher on top of the mountain in the middle of the night figuring that he was going to play a prank on the two people that were camped right in between the ghost town and the Indian burial ground. I tend to agree with you on that. It, a person doesn't make sense in a lot of those situations. You know, people get shot that doing that kind of stuff in the middle of the night coming up. And well, yeah, especially in Montana, everybody's got a gun. Everybody will shoot first and ask questions later. And I shouldn't say everybody, but the vast majority. There's, you know, there's grizzly bears and mountain lions and stuff. People can't mess around here and have a reasonable expectation of safety. When in doubt, they shoot. Well, going back to the uh, Indian reservation that you mentioned. Uh, it's the other thing that I've been told. These say, well, if you subscribe to the conspiracy theorists I, I just mentioned, uh, one of the things he said was, why do you think there's so many sightings around Native American reservations, the Indian reservations? Uh, most people think the Indians are crazy. And so mm -hmm. what a better way to unleash these things around those communities because, you know, they got a story for everything, and most people think Indians are just nut jobs anyway. Uh, I'm not saying that I do, so I, please, the Native Americans listening, please don't take offense to that. But he was saying, what what a better way to unleash these things than around the reservations? Because 
Most people won't believe what the natives have to say about these things. Well, you could have the same sort of an attitude about uh, the South out of Kentucky or Tennessee or something where it's like, well, who sees Bigfoot down there? Well, just those crazy hillbillies and moonshiners, you know, pardon me, folks, I don't mean any of that, but that would be that would be what somebody would say. You know, it's those, it's those hillbillies out in the middle of nowhere that are making up the Bigfoot stories. Uh, no, those hillbillies out in the middle of nowhere are living next to Bigfoot. That's why they're seeing him, because they're in the middle of nowhere. They're not making up stories. They're trying to describe to you what it is that's bothering them that lives around the area where they're living. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And it's like like anything else. You want to you want to find out about weird things out in the forest? Well, go talk to a hunter. Go talk to those quote unquote hillbillies. Go talk to the Native Americans. Those are the people out there all the time that run into weird things. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, you know, to give them their, their just due, the Native Americans are my go-to guys. When I want to look and see if something's actually real and if it's been around for a long time, I go look at their legends and words first. Because if it has been around a long time and it really is a real thing, they knew about it, they've got a name for it, they've got stories about it. If they haven't mentioned anything about it, it's, it's either uh, misidentification, hoax, lie, or some recent construct like we were just talking about. People always say, they used to say to me, well, you know, the, they'll never share anything with the white, quote-unquote, white man. Baloney. You go ask them, don't be a dick, go ask them, and they'll tell you stuff. They'll tell you what they know. Uh, I've never come mm-hmm. across a Native American that wasn't willing to share information, and as long as you approach it a certain way, they'll share with you what they've seen or what they know about a certain topic. And a lot of times they'll tell you, too, if they think it's more of a, legends and stories or if it was something real a lot of, you just have to ask them and they'll tell you yeah that's it and you know part of the reason why they don't go around offering this information is because they've had they've been the butts with so much ridicule from the supposedly educated western white man society giving them a hard time oh those that can't be real oh those things don't really exist oh that's just some savage superstition no these people lived here way before we did they know what the heck is living around here and, you know, they're very well acquainted with it and what its behaviors are. If it's a real thing, they know about it. And, I, and you're right, Wes. All you got to do is just, you know, ask them in a, a non-ridiculing way, you know, like I'm not here to pick on you or anything. I saw something, and have you guys ever seen anything like this? You know, and they'll come right out if they've seen anything like that. They'll tell you. And if they haven't, they'll go, well, my cousin saw, you know, he found a track over here, you know, somebody that I know saw this or something like that. And I I talked to a couple of uh, natives just out of the blue that I just ran into on the street corner and brought up, uh, you know, something that I had seen in the woods. And the one of them actually had three encounters, uh, one when he was a kid and two when he was out hunting, and just around the local area here, you know. And you don't find that stuff out unless you actually go ask them something. So they're not going to volunteer that information. They're sick and tired of being ridiculed. Yeah, it's a shame. Like I said in the last show you and I did, Duke, that this world is a lot stranger and a lot crazier than I think most people realize. Like I said before, you get up, you go to work, you work your Monday through Friday, spend time with the family, do whatever on the weekend. And when you actually start looking into some of this stuff, there really is stuff to there really is something to it. There really is something not everyone's lying, you know, in a lot of this stuff. <laughs> and I think if we actually knew the truth about all the strange legends and, and stories and I think people would be terrified. I think they'd be completely terrified. Well, I totally agree with you because frankly I'm terrified. <laughs> And the more, I, the more I learn about this, it isn't getting any more pleasant. It just seems to get scarier and scarier. So, again, like we were saying last week, uh, you know, you guys be careful what you ask for because you might just get it and you might not be too happy that you did. Yeah, you're absolutely right. One last question I want to ask you about the mountain giants. Have you heard anything, anyone talk about the vocalizations? Or have, was there any reports of them vocalizing? Same exact thing as the uh, Wendigo loud, uh, piercing, high-pitched, piercing whistle that they use for hunting and communicating with each other. Well, that doesn't make me feel better. I was hoping you'd say no. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, so if you hear the whistle, it's, you know, it's potentially when to go or 
potentially a mountain giant. And again, you know, that brings up the thing, well, look, they're both using the same vocalization. They've both got these, uh, you know, pretty predatory looking set of chompers on them. They're both described as having claws on their feet and their hands. Are they perhaps related? Another possibility to think about. Duke, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. You know, the mountain giant, the mountain giant uh, encounters are fascinating to me and I don't know a whole lot about it. Like I said, I've only had a few people tell me little details about what they've seen. So I appreciate you coming back on. I know you're quickly becoming a fan favorite. The fans just really wanted to have you back. And I know you've had a long week and I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. Wes, it's always a pleasure being on your show. Anytime you want me back or the fans test me enough to make you get me back again, I'll be happy to come back again. If you, uh, you know, you ever need to ask me questions or anything, just get a hold of me. And, um, I'm a fan of Sasquatch Chronicles too. I've, I've been listening to it since you were, uh, you had your little YouTube presence and, and that was it, man. You know, so I've been along for this ride listening to what you've been up to too, Wes, you know, and you got one of the best broadcasts out there. So it's always an honor for me to be on here and be more than happy to come back and do it again in the, in the future if anybody wants me back again. The honor was mine. Thank you, sir. All righty, buddy.